Welcome to the podcast for Westside A Jesus Church. We hope this teaching encourages and empowers you to love, learn, and live the way of Jesus. If you've been a part of Westside for a while, maybe you've heard part of our story. Uh, Last time I was here, I told you a little bit. um, Just two weeks ago, we had, uh, 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 we celebrated more, uh, a week of prayer and fasting for more of God in our life and city. And so we scattered all across the city of Bend in little groups and we prayed for God's kingdom to come there as it is in heaven. It was just such a really, really rich time. Also, last, last time I was here, I told you a little bit about our space, the place that we get to gather in Bend. So when we started uh, praying for the city of Bend, we felt like God was leading us to the west side of Bend. And if you know Bend at all, it's like really hard to find a place to like rent to live, let alone to find a place to gather for church. And so our team spent many months just like praying for God to open up a door for us to be able to gather on the west side. And so really long story short, um, we, our prayers were answered in, in the hot tub at the Bend Athletic Club. And I just, I love that that's a part of our story. I always tell that part because it's so great. Okay, so one of my friends was sitting in the hot tub at the Bend Athletic Club and he bumped into this guy who's an elder at a 99-year-old church right in the heart of downtown Bend. And it's this really iconic building from the 1940s. It's the only church in town with a white steeple. It's just really, it's really, really cool, you guys. So anyways, long story short, we ended up being able to rent that space for them from them on Sunday evenings. And that's where we've been this whole time. Uh, a little bit of an update about us. Um, as of July 1st, that church, 100 years old, gave us the building. They gave us the building. Isn't that so cool? Yeah. This is the stuff. This is the stuff that God does. This isn't something that we like made happen or whatever. God is just gracious. He's doing something really new and really cool and bend and we get to be a part of it. It's so, so awesome. So we have the deed in hand and like the title that was originally deeded to this family in the 1860s by President Harrison. It's just insane. It's really, really cool. So thank you guys so much for your prayers, for your support. The real value of the church is not really in the building, even though it's really, really fantastic. The value is the people and you guys get that you guys understand that really well you guys are part of our extended family really the best kind of sending church that we could ever ask for so in preparation for this trip I I really wanted to like express my gratitude to Westside to you all for everything that you've done and so I've been kind of racking my brain and then this week it kind of it dawned on me so Dom came out to Bend a few months ago and he asked for a quick tour of our building and you guys have a really awesome spot here with like the garage and the cool concrete and then like the Stumptown coffee outside okay you've got it really going on you've got it going on here at west side we don't have anything quite like that but there was one thing that dom saw and when he saw it i could tell there was you know jealousy in his <laughs> eyes he was he really wanted it so nice guy that i am before i left yesterday i went and i got it for him <laughs> reserved pastors parking so this is for dom we, I think we decided, like, we're going to reserve a space for him over there by, like, the Burger King or something like that. <laughs> so he's in the UK uh, this week, so I'll give it to you guys, and it'll be waiting for him when he gets back, all right? <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so that, it, that's all joking aside. Like, that was a joke, but you guys, we really love you so much. Thank you for everything that you're doing to support Riverbend Church, and come visit us. It's going to be really great. Okay, so Jonah chapter 4. You guys ready for this? Go ahead, open in your Bibles with me to Jonah chapter 4. And as you do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you so much for your grace, that that's who you are. Your nature is that you're a patient and loving God. And we came here tonight, or today, not to be a part of like a like stale religious experience, we came to encounter you, we came to learn from you, we came to open up the scriptures and gain perspective on life from you. So God, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us and we ask that as we study your word that you would impart wisdom and that you, we would truly have a, a deep sense of what you want to do in our life and that we would be inspired and have courage to walk it out. So Jesus, we love you so much and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen, amen. Okay, so how are you guys liking the story of Jonah so far? It's good, right? It's not quite like what you might remember from your children's Bible growing up though, right? 
our culture has really hit this story with a Sunday school stick, right? We've edited it down for a kid's story. And, and that's not all bad or whatever, but the, the story the, in its fullness is really, it's filled with tension and irony. Jonah, this man of God, is a reluctant prophet. He runs away, 180, 180 degrees away from where God had sent him because of fear and, and because of hatred for the Assyrians. But then, good news, we found out last week um, that he gets a second chance and he takes it. Phil reminded us that God is merciful. He's merciful. It wasn't too late for Jonah and it's not too late for you and me to align ourselves with God's vision for life. He is a God of second chances. Come on, people. That is good, right? So good. I've needed that second chance, and I'm sure there are a number of you here as well that have as well. So chapter three ends in this massive awakening to the goodness of God. All of Nineveh turns from their evil ways, the scripture tells us, and God forgives them. He, he, he doesn't go through with the destruction that he had planned. And we're picking it up in chapter four, verse one. Chapter four, verse one. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who re relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. That, but the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant, okay, and made it grow over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the plant. Oh, good. Jonah's, like, capable of happiness. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And it is, he said, and I'm so angry that I wish I were dead. Okay, third time, third time, crazy. But the Lord said, You've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The end. <laughs> That's the end of the story. What is going on here, right? Right? This story would have been much easier to deal with if it ended in chapter 3, right? I mean, sure, there was, there was some tension and some conflict, but Jonah had repented, and he ended up doing what God had asked him to do, and Nineveh listened and responded to his message, and so they were forgiven, and God uh, didn't bring about the calamity or the destruction that he had planned, and the conflict was pretty much resolved. But now this, chapter 4, it really goes sideways. It goes sideways, doesn't it? Which brings up another question. If this is a necessary part of the story, where's chapter five, right? This can't possibly be the end of the story. Does he change his mind? Does he run down and throw a party with the Ninevites? What happens? Right, seriously, what happens? This can't be the end of the story with all of this tension and controversy and conflict between Yahweh and his prophet, the, uh, our protagonist. But actually, that's the, the literary genius of the unsterilized, unfiltered version of this book. The full effect of Jonah's message, uh, when we read it for all that it's worth, is absolutely amazing. The author actually wants us to sit in and wrestle through the scandal of what's going on here. And the point isn't necessarily how Jonah responds. The point is, how will we respond when God loves our enemy? That's the point that Jonah is trying to get at here. Okay, so we're going to dive in and take it a few lines at a time. Verse 1, <laughs> keep in mind that any other prophet would have killed for this kind of response to his message. I mean, think about it. Jonah announces this seven-word 
a sermon on the streets of an extremely corrupt and violent city, and within a few days, the whole population is falling on their faces and crying out for more of God and for forgiveness. So this would be like if you got on the max and rode down to a kind of a sketchy neighborhood in Portland and you started walking up to people and saying, hey, um, you know, God has so much more for your life. You're destroying yourself and, 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 and others. If you ask for forgiveness and turn to Jesus, then you'll flourish. You'll have this brand new life in God's kingdom. And then they, people started responding. And then within a, a few days, all of Portland is on their knees crying out and following after Jesus. And, you know, Ted Wheeler's on Facebook or something, and he's like announcing a day of prayer and and worship at Pioneer Courthouse Square or something. Really, honestly, that's what's going on in Nineveh in the story. It's a full-blown awakening to the goodness of God on a city-wide scale. It's the kind of response that we're praying for in Portland and we're praying for in Bend. Every messenger, every prophet, every teacher, every, every missionary dreams of this kind of response to their message. But what about Jonah? He's mad. He's, he's really angry, in fact, and he lashes out in his anger against Yahweh. So this is the real reason we find out that Jonah fled for Tarshish in the beginning. He felt that it was wrong for the Assyrians to be given this opportunity for forgiveness. Look at what Jonah says in the second part of verse two. He says, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Verse three, now Lord, take away my life for it's better for me to die than to live. Okay, this is getting really kind of crazy, isn't it? Jonah feels that his life is over. He'd rather die than to serve a God like Yahweh. So this is a really, really tense scene, okay? But then that line in verse two, you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, and so on. Does that sound familiar to you? If you're, if you're familiar with the story of the Bible, then you may know that this is one of the most quoted sayings in the Bible from the Bible. In fact, it's part of God's self-disclosure statement to, uh, to the, his people in the desert at Mount Sinai. Turn with me to uh, Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. And as you're turning there, let me explain a little bit of the backstory. So the Israelites had just been rescued by God from the Egyptians, and they were en route to the land that God had promised Abraham 400 plus years prior. So they were the generation that were going to realize God's promise for their entire nation. It was like a huge, huge privilege. And along the way, God meets with Moses on Mount Sinai, where he delivers the Ten Commandments and he renews the covenant with his people. So it's this really outstanding moment in the story of God with his nation, Israel. But at the same time, while Moses is meeting with God, the rest of Israel gets impatient. They're at the base of the mountain and they erect this golden calf and I'll spare you the the gross details or whatever but they engage in like a sexual like fertility ritual of some kind it's a terrible awful rebellion against God so most of you know the story Moses comes down from the mountain and he throws down uh, the, the stone tablets which have, which have the Ten Commandments inscribed of them, on them as like a, 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 a representation of the shattering of the covenant. So that's Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 33, Moses meets with God again, and this time he's crying out to God saying, hey, you said that I'm supposed to lead these people, but they're rebellious and they're, they're, they're stiff-necked people. Please don't send me unless you plan to go with me. And so God replies, he says, my presence is going to go with you. And then Moses is like, okay, now if, if you're coming with me, then I can do it. And then he says this, now show me your glory. That's Exodus chapter 33. Now, Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. As he passed in front of Moses, that's Yahweh, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Beautiful, right? So hundreds of years later, Jonah is throwing God's words back in his face. I knew that's who you are. I knew you were this kind of God. 
And uh, this had been like a really sacred moment in Israel's story because God's presence drew near to them even after such a deep betrayal. So this was a cherished moment in the story of Israel. But, but, but Jonah is throwing these words back in, in his face. Here's the real irony. Here's the real irony. If God were not a gracious God, a compassionate God, a patient God, a loving God, then Jonah would have never existed. The nation of Israel would have been wiped out a hundred times over by now. And so Jonah owed everything that he was to God's goodness. And he had no problem with that. God being gracious with him, being loving and forgiving and patient with him. But he felt that it was deeply, deeply wrong when that same grace was extended to his enemy. So um, if you think about it, not very many of us are probably feeling all that bad for Jonah in this moment. He's acting kind of nuts. He's irreverent to God. He says he'd rather die than live. It's all very dramatic, right? Which you have to forgive me. Like I kind of look at this through the lens of my situation right now, which I have a five-year-old daughter named Isabel, and she's the most amazing little girl in the whole wide world. I love her more than life itself. She's the best. But she's also right now going through this kind of dramatic phase. So an example, um, the other day she asked me for a treat. That's her thing. She loves treats. And uh, I said, no, sweetie, not right now. You can't have a treat. And she goes, daddy, this is the worst day ever. (laughs) Really? After one little, I said no to one thing. And he says, it's the worst day ever. Okay. So that's my, that's my lens. That's how I'm kind of viewing Jonah right now. He's just complaining to God about everything, everything, everything. So we don't really like feel too bad for him. But I think we can really relate to the sentiment here of his objection. By and large, we love the idea of God's grace. We're grateful for the God of second chances. We love that Jesus' love is this undying, unflinching part of his, his nature for sure. But we still want our enemies, the ones who've wronged us, the ones who've caused us pain, to be held responsible for their sin, to be held responsible for their actions and the things that they've done to hurt us. See, this is the scandal of God's grace. I've heard one Hebrew scholar even call this the dark side of God's grace. So before we get into this too much, I I want you to know that, that Jesus, he empathizes with your situation wherever you're at. The whole point of the incarnation is that he entered our brokenness so that we could be healed and made new. Philippians tells us that he actually emptied himself of some of his divine attributes so that he could identify with our suffering. So that's who he is and that's what he did. And then he died on the cross so that we could have real life again. But uh, the idea of salvation by grace through faith, not based on merit, means that his forgiveness is available to all sinners, traitors, our enemies even included in that. So forgiving the Assyrians for for Jonah, their their brutality against Israel, it was no joke. It would have been super hard. And I know that in a room this size, there's bound to be a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, a lot of excruciating pain, in fact. And the point is that that's actually legitimate. It's not that it's not. And the, the evil that some of you have experienced at the hands of really broken people is really messed up. And, and it's not what God had in mind, and it's really excruciating. But core to Jesus' gospel is the idea that accepting grace for yourself also means forgiving and loving and accepting grace for your enemy. Because you freely received forgiveness from God, now God is empowering you to reflect his image by offering forgiveness to others. That's how this works. Um, when I was 19 years old, I was just finishing up my, my first year of Bible college in Maui, Hawaii. It was the best year ever. That's where I met Dom, actually. And so, uh, and I got a call from a pastor, uh, Rich and, and Jordy Jones, some really good friends even to this day. And he said to me, he said, hey, we just want you to know that we believe in what God's doing in your life. And so we want you to consider moving back to Oregon, uh, continuing your education and serving as one of the youth pastors here. So, if you're wondering to yourself, why on earth would anybody invite a 19-year-old guy to pastor teenagers? That's an excellent question. I have no idea. I have no idea why they took that kind of a chance on me, but I'm so glad that they did because it was such a great experience where I got to grow and fail and learn and repeat all of that over again. They gave me a lot of room, and uh, I'm really grateful to that experience, sir. 
uh, to, to this day remain some of the most uh, important people in my journey of, of in my vocation as a pastor. Um, and so I guess that we're still friends with them today. About two and a half years ago, their oldest daughter was uh, working at an apartment complex. And I uh, apologize in advance for how um, horrifying this story is, but she was, she was working at this apartment complex in the middle of the afternoon, in the middle of the parking lot, a complete stranger, 17-year-old guy, comes up to her and stabs her to death. She loved Jesus and she left behind her husband, two young kids, her mom and her dad, two brothers, two sisters. It's a completely senseless and unprovoked attacked, attack. And eventually the police, they um, arrested the suspect. And to make matters worse, um, this guy had already proven to be a really violent criminal already. And, and so he was awaiting trial for something different and, and no one could really give them a good explanation as to why he was free to even commit this crime in the first place. But anyways, the, the, court, uh, the, the case goes to trial uh, sometime last year. And then a few months ago, the jury came back with a guilty verdict. And uh, as you may know, after a conviction like this, the judge sometimes invites the family, the victim's family, to address the court. And so Rich, my friend and mentor, he takes the platform or he takes the, the, the floor or whatever. And he just forgets that everyone else is there except for this one guy. And he says, hi, May. Look at me. And he, wait, he just waits until this guy, who's been completely uh, re- uh, non-emotional this whole time, and he waits for him to look at him, and then he says, I just want you to know that on behalf of my entire family, we forgive you for what you did to Nicole. What we want for you is to consider your life, for you to consider your soul, Please take our forgiveness as a brand new beginning for your life. And then he sits down. And then his wife, Nicole's mom, gets up and same thing. Hi, May, look at me. Not how dare you take my daughter's life and throw it away like it was nothing. No, she said, I pray for you every day that you would receive the forgiveness that Jesus brings. Westside, that is God's heart for our enemy. That's God's heart for our enemy. And so um, everyone in the courtroom, of course, as you can imagine, was just completely speechless. You can actually read the Oregon Live article. It's, It's all there for you to go and to see. See, the point, here's the point. The true, unabashed grace of God is profoundly upside down from the world's way of dealing with evil. What about poetic justice? Why should I let him off so easy or whatever? No, that's not the point. God's heart is for full reconciliation. His heart is for redemption. And while Jonah wanted that for himself, he wasn't ready to extend that to the Ninevites. Look with me at verses four and five. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what was going to happen to the city. Okay, so to me, this is starting to feel a little bit like a therapy session where God is speaking to Jonah and he's saying, okay, Jonah, I can see that you're really upset. You think that my grace is too wide. You say that I'm being too liberal with my love. Is that fair for you? Is that fair for you? Is that justifiable for you to feel that way? And how does Jonah respond? He gives God the silent treatment. He says, whatever, I don't even care. And then he just goes, goes away. I don't recommend it. That's not, not a good attitude to have towards God. Instead, he just goes out and he finds a camping spot and uh, waits to see what's going to happen to the city. Remember, God had, had said before that he was going to overthrow Nineveh. Some of your translations may say that he was going to destroy Nineveh. And so Jonah is sitting back, hoping against hope that this city is going to crumble to the ground, that, the, that he's going to have a front row seat to the whole thing. 
But that's not what happens. It's not what happens at all. This is my favorite part of the whole book. I'm so glad that I get to teach this part. It's, that, it's so, so good. The, um, the God's wordplay here is brilliant, and it ticks Jonah off even more. Here's what I'm getting at. That word in here um, for overthrow or destroy is the Hebrew word hapak. Can you say that with me? Hapak. That was, good. That, that, that was fun. Good job. Uh, so hapak, here's what hapak means. Um, it means to overthrow or destroy, like we've said. Here's another example of it in scriptures. The sin of my people is greater than that of Sodom, which was hapak, or destroyed, in a moment without a hand to help. So that's Jonah's perception of what's going to happen in Nineveh. That's what he announces in the city. Funny enough, though, Jonah doesn't mention how the Ninevites can get right with God in his seven-word sermon, if you notice. He didn't even mention God, in fact, in his message at all. The one he's supposed to be representing, which is kind of interesting. Some uh, scholars have read into that exchange the idea that he's actually trying to get away with not giving the full message of redemption because he's actually looking forward to Nineveh's destruction. It's crazy. If it's true, it doesn't work at all. Here's here's where it gets super interesting. Just like words in English, Hebrew words like hapak have a range of meaning. Here's what I mean by that. Okay, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine ran in Ben's half marathon, and he did a really good job. And when he was done, uh, I didn't say, hey man, great job. I said, dude, you crushed it. You crushed it. And so that word crush, you know, in my vernacular, doesn't mean to like literally like, like crush something or whatever. It's, he did a really good job, okay? So words in English and words in Hebrew have a range of meaning. So hapak in scripture can also mean changed or transformed, like in Psalm chapter 30, verse 11. You hapak, or turned, my grief and mourning into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Isn't that so good? It's really, really good. So Jonah had destruction in mind, but um, God had something different. And if his message was half-hearted or not, I don't know, but it doesn't work. God still uses it, This message to humble the hearts of Nineveh. So yeah, destruction was coming, God might say. Destruction was was coming, but they repented. And so transformation is way, way better than destruction, right? So that's God's heart for you and I as well. It's not too late. Doesn't matter what you've done or how many times you've done it. God wants to forgive you. He wants to bring you into right relationship with him. That's his heart. That's who he is. He's a gracious and compassionate God. Uh, 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but that all would come to repentance. You can be forgiven. More on that in in just a second. How you guys doing? You doing okay? You look really good. We're almost, (laughs) you do, you do. It's a good looking crew. Um, We're almost done. Almost done with the book of Jonah. We're, oh, wow, this is great. We're finishing up the book today. Um, starting in verse 6, we're going to take it through the end of, of the chapter. This is God's second attempt to reason with Jonah. Final therapy session, if you will. Uh, verse 6, Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Yeah, we get that. We're Oregonians. We love plants too. We get happy about them. But, uh, verse seven, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed up the plant so that it withered. Okay, first there's a storm, then there's a whale, then there's a plant, and now a worm. This is a kind of a strange story. It's a great story, but it's a little bit strange. It's okay. Um, when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And he wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die and to live, yada, yada. That's his thing. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, like, arg. He's just like really upset right now. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Third time in this story, he says this, okay? But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend to it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? End of book. Okay. 
Okay, this is all really strange. It is. If you're thinking to yourself, what on earth is going on here? It's okay. There's, most of us are like that right now. In fact, that's kind of the point. If you're here for week one, you might remember that uh, Dom mentioned that parts of this book uh, is written uh, in the literary style is a little bit like Western satire. And when he said that, he was speaking about these couple of verses. It's satirical in nature. Jonah is a caricature of religious hypocrisy. It's sad, but it's also kind of funny. He's a comical character, and we're meant to kind of see the humor in it. There's wordplay and irony that's baked into the story. Up is down, down is up. For example, the Ninevites, who are supposed to be these godless pagans or whatever, turn out to be super soft-hearted in spirit to God and his message, and they repent. But God's representative, the prophet, on the other hand, is totally hard-hearted. He's a walking contradiction, right? So all of this is written into the story for our benefit so that we'll examine and poke at just how ridiculous Jonah is being and reflect on ourselves, our own heart, and how we treat the people in our life. Are you with me? Good, all right, the four of you who are, very good. Uh, so there's all kinds of, uh, of, of kind of confusion about the plant and the worm. What do they symbolize or whatever? And it's, it's really pretty simple. This is what we need to understand. Jonah is camped out east of town. He's not a happy camper, literally. That was for Dom. I had to get one in just for Dom, just for him. And, and so there's now there wasn't a whole lot of shade, so God provides this big leafy plant so that he has some relief from the sun. Good, he's like super happy about it. For the first time in the whole book, Jonah is happy. He's got a friend now to like keep him company or something. I don't know. Um, but as soon as the plant arrives, then it's destroyed. It's, it's, it's eaten up by a worm. So he has this mood swing where he's super happy, and then he's mood swinging right back, and he's back to good old Jonah as we know him. He wants to die again, right? So, uh, so here's the point. God is at least getting some kind of a response out of Jonah this time. And so he asks him, is it right for you to be upset about the plant? So here's kind of what's happening. Um, from God's perspective, it's like, okay, Jonah, you're being kind of ridiculous here. We're all sort of laughing at you, but... Let's just say for a moment that it's justifiable for you to be so upset about this plant. Okay, so that's what's kind of going, he's, he's posing the situation to Jonah. He says, okay, so did you plant the seed that one day became the plant? No. Did you water the plant, Jonah? No. Well, did you make it grow? No. Well, it hasn't really been in your life all that long, Jonah. It's only been around for like 24 hours, but you seem to still really have a really emotional attachment to this plant, don't you? And he's like, yes, I do. I really have this as much, I'm so bad about it, okay? And so that's, that's really what's, it's okay to laugh. It's kind of a joke. It really is. So, uh, so, so then God says, okay, well, let's just assume that you're justifiable in feeling this way about the plant. Isn't it okay then for me, Jonah, to be concerned about, I don't know, a whole city worth of people who are made into my image, 120,000 people and all of their livestock. After all, I created them. They're made in my image and I care deeply about them. And they don't know their right hand from their left hand, which was probably a Hebrew idiom meaning that they've like totally lost their way. They're morally destitute and all of, all of that. So what do you say, Jonah? Nothing. The book ends, right? It ends really abruptly. There's no explanation, no response from Jenna, just God reasoning with his prophet, isn't it fair for me to love your enemies? And uh, something I think in our Western brain just really hurts when there's no resolution to the story. You know what I mean? Like when you're watching Netflix, you know that we do this. You're watching Netflix and there's some episode of the show that you're really into or whatever, and there's only like two minutes left. And the hero is like still in jail or something and there's no no possible way that he's going to get in out in time to like save the world or the planet or whatever and so we're like no no what's going to happen and then that dreaded like to be continued phrase is on the you're like no but then there's like that little you know countdown clock 14 seconds until the next episode starts and you're like oh man there's no way i'm not watching the next episode I need to know what happens next in the story, right? That's just like how we work. You're laughing because it's true. And Netflix knows how to get us to watch the next one. They just know how to do that. 
Um, so, so that's what's, that's what we kind of long for. It's like weird for us or it hurts our brain when there's no resolution to the story. Um, but, uh, but in the case of Jonah, that abrupt ending serves on a really extremely important purpose. The question isn't whether or not Jonah does what he should or shouldn't do or if his heart really changes. The whole story from chapter one until now has been leading us to a couple of really important reflections and meditations. Number one, most importantly, how are we, you and I, living into this reality that God loves our enemy and that we're invited to love our enemy as well? That's weird what the book of Jonah is about, you and me. So if you're anything like me, then this first part of this statement, I can kind of get on board with. I can kind of wrap my head around it a little bit. This is who God is. That's just how he is. I'm not crazy about it all the time, but that's just, this is our God. This is who he is. And, but that second part of the statement, that is something we really take issue with, right? God, you can't possibly be asking me to love my enemy. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. In practice, absolutely. But even just in theory, when someone is terrible to us, um, at best, we want to just like cut them out of our life and eliminate them entirely. And I understand where that's coming from. But at worst, we want to be terrible right back to them because that's just how it works. If someone's awful to us and does something really terrible, we want them to feel the exact same way. So we want to retaliate. We want revenge. We want like poetic justice or, or whatever. That's just how the world works. All you really have to do is open up your Twitter app and you'll see what I mean, right? That's just what, what happens. But, but Jesus has something completely different completely different in mind for his people. He comes on the scene and he's displaying all kinds of authority and power over the kingdom of darkness. He shows us what real life looks like, right? He shows us what real shalom, what real flourishing is all about. It's like he's over hatred and he's free to live life as God intended and he loves his enemies and he's teaching about his kingdom which is totally right side up in his mind from the way that the world the world does things and forgiveness of enemies is core it's center at the center of Jesus's gospel he's talking about it all the time like this example out of Luke chapter 6 but to you who are listening I say love your enemies do good to those who hate you Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Wow, that's unbelievable, right? It's so good. So if we're reading all of this right, and I think that we are, then we're naturally going to feel some of this tension like Jonah did. Do I really do this? Do I really do that? I think in, in reality, if we're being honest, I think sometimes we wish that these verses didn't even really exist, and, and, and I just want to say, especially if there's like a fresh wound in your life right now, where you're going through a, a hurt where somebody was, was, was awful to you and someone behaved like an enemy, then this is no small thing. And I, I really get that. There's a lot of gravity. There's a lot of weight to this idea. This teaching is actually pretty hard for us to kind of grapple with and wrestle through. And there's real pain in your life. There's real hurt and all of that's legitimate. You have real, a real enemy in your life right now. But in reality, I think we really need these scriptures. We need these scriptures to be here because this is exactly who we were when Jesus died for us. See, Ephesians chapter two tells us that we used to be enemies to God. We rejected his vision for life and we set off on our own journey of kind of like being totally self-consumed where we're the center of the story and God can like play along if he'd like, but really life is all about us. And so we've contributed to the brokenness that's in the world around us. And some people are broken in, in different ways or in more ways than others. That's very true. But in reality, we are all in need of God's grace. And so that's what God is trying to show Jonah. Can't you see, Jonah, that all of your religious superiority is offensive and destructive, just like the war crimes of, of Nineveh. But he's so blind to his own hypocrisy that he can't even see that he's really the problem. He's the bad guy. In, in this story, and he doesn't even know it. But good news, there is good news. All of this brokenness and, and fighting and hatred and hypocrisy and discrimination, all of it, which has kind of ruled the day, all came to a grinding halt at the cross where Jesus loved all of his enemies. 
So no one who tries to keep people away from God's grace has any leg to stand on. The entire point of the cross, in fact, is that anyone who will repent receives forgiveness. Anyone who repents receives forgiveness. So being a follower of Jesus, for you and me, it means that we champion his vision for life. His vision for life becomes ours. And so I know our, our tendency when we picture our enemies, which would be not, not, not a bad thing to do now, I'm sure you can all think of that person in your life who's behaved like an enemy and they're just really, really hard for you to love, met, let alone just even like or be in the same room with. It's, it's easy for us to picture them and think that, man, they don't deserve my love. They don't deserve my forgiveness. And that's true. This is, again, this is a hard teaching. It's true. Maybe in your life, these people, they don't deserve your forgiveness. And so when we think about obeying Jesus' command to love our enemies, we think about it in terms of obligation. Because it's like, ah, it's something that he said we have to, and so I'm going to like try and sort of do it or, or whatever. But if we take Jesus at his word, this is how we were created to live, right? This was his vision from, from the beginning, fully reconciled to God and, and humanity and the rest of creation, that's what we're made for. So, so in that case then, um, instead of obligation, what if we looked at loving our enemies as the best way forward? What if we looked at loving our enemies as an opportunity to grow and mature in our experience of God's grace? You see, we're, where we're not just like receiving God's grace for ourselves, but we're actually giving it, we're sharing it, we're channeling God's grace to others, in particular our enemies. You see, when Jesus loved his enemies, we don't get the sense that it was robbing him of life. No, we, he, he was like living free. The power of grace, guys, the power of grace and, and forgiveness is greater than the power of brokenness and unforgiveness. So loving your enemy can actually be a catalyst for transformation in your life. So, so while you might think of your enemy as kind of getting in the way of you following after Jesus, maybe your enemy is in your life for the precise purpose of causing you, giving you an opportunity to grow and mature and experiencing his grace and sharing his grace with the world. Um, uh, this uh, brilliant uh, theologian, Walter Wink, has this to say. This is the gift our enemy may be able to bring us, to see aspects of ourselves that we cannot discover any other way than through our enemies. Our friends seldom show us our flaws. They are our friends precisely because they're able to overlook or ignore, the, ignore those parts of us, which is true. The enemy is therefore not merely a hurdle to be leaped over on the way to God. Our enemy might actually be the way to God. So we cannot come to terms with our own inner shadows except through our enemies. We have almost no other access to those unacceptable parts of ourselves that, needing redeeming, uh, that need redeeming except through the mirror that our enemies hold up to us. Isn't that brilliant? It's so good. It's so true. It's the way of Jesus here. It's Jesus' vision. Um, but if, again, if you're like me, this is, is, it sounds great and, and everything. But it also feels a little bit daunting, doesn't it? It feels a little bit daunting to like step into this new vision for life that's radical and upside down or right side up, depending on how you look at it, from the ways world of dealing with evil. So here's the best part of the whole, whole thing. Don't, don't miss this. You're not alone. You're, you're, you're not alone. You're not meant to go about the task of loving your enemy in your own strength, striving, do it, absolutely, love your enemy, but you don't have to do it. You're not meant to do it in your own power or striving kind of in your own strength. Remember, this is who God has already revealed himself to be. This is who he is. He, he loves. He's a compassionate God. He's slow to anger. He loves to relent from destruction. He loves that. That's who he is by nature. And Jesus said right before he ascended into heaven, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. So we have access to God and his power for the sake of, of loving our enemy. And uh, so to close, what if we saw loving our enemy as the best way forward? And what if we saw loving our enemy as an opportunity to grow and mature in our experience of God's grace.